So as we talk about all the bacteria that are gram positive, so everything in this whole po this PowerPoint, they're all gram positive bacteria. So if we gram stain them, they're going to be that nice purple color. Uh, how we organize all the gram positive bacteria, we organize them first by shape, so whether they are gram positive in cocci shaped, or if they're gram positive in bacilli or rod shaped. Because there's a lot of gram positive cocci bacteria, we sort them out by doing a test called a, called a catalase test. And this is the one time I wish lab was actually right before lecture, because we're going to do the catalase test today on bacteria. I just put this up here just if you wanted to know, like, what the heck does it mean by catalase? A catalase test is there are some bacteria, primarily Staphylococcus bacteria, there's a few other genus that can do it, but Staph bacteria can make an enzyme called catalase. That's what we're testing for, is the presence of this particular enzyme. And how we know that it, there's catalase being produced is we add some hydrogen peroxide. If catalase is present, this enzyme, it's an enzyme, takes hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2, and breaks it down into water and oxygen. Um, that oxygen is a gas. We know that we're breathing it. And because we now have these gas, this oxygen gas being produced, we visually see it as bubbles. Have you guys ever put hydrogen peroxide on a wound before? And did it bubble? <laughs> because there was some staph bacteria that were there. Uh, staph bacteria, it's one of their, you know, protective functions is if you put hydrogen peroxide on a staph bacteria, whether it's staph epidermitis, which is all over your skin, or staph aureus, which is what we're testing you guys for um, in lab, staph bacteria are just going to take that hydrogen peroxide, they're going to give it some catalase, and they break it down into harmless water and harmless oxygen. So hydrogen peroxide will not kill staph bacteria. So if you're like, oh, I think there's some staph aureus here, I'll put some hydrogen peroxide on it, it will do nothing. Um, it can kill other things, which is usually what we're using it for. Um, and so it's an easy thing we can test for. So if it's catalase positive, we know it's some kind of staph, and then there's other tests to do, which we'll do in lab, to know which staph. If it's catalase negative, which means there's no bubbles whatsoever, then we know it's some other type of gram-positive cocci-shaped bacteria. And the top choices that cause us human diseases are bacteria that are in the streptococcus genus and bacteria that are in the enterococcus genus. Now, we already tested you guys for streptococcus pyogenes, but it's not the only strep bacteria out there. Uh, we're going to talk about some other streptococcus bacteria. Um, a few, I think at least one was in the intro. Um, we'll talk about the other top causing diseases today. So just kind of refresh where we're at. So uh, the intro video, I just wanted to have that up, talks about Streptococcus pyogenes, the bacteria that causes strep throat and all the things that allow it to cause disease. And I think it ended right there. Um, the other type, I'm actually going to go back a slide, I want this picture. Because there are so many Streptococcus bacteria, uh, we group them into different antigens that they have on their surface. There's group A antigens and group B antigens, and although there are group C, D, um, G, F, and there's other antigens as well, the only ones that cause diseases that have these particular antigens are the ones that are in group A and B. These are called Lansfield grouping, it's just based on surface antigens. I don't care too much about it. Just, you know, I'm like, there's lots of strep bacteria out there. Most of them that cause disease are in A and B grouping, but then there's a whole bunch of other strep that don't have any of those antigens, but they're still strep bacteria. Let me get back to. So, one of the top group B strep bacteria is Streptococcus agalactii. Again, there's lots of fun words for it. Again, when we gram stain it, it's all gram positive, everything in this PowerPoint is. It likes to hang out in chains, as a lot of strep do like to hang out in chains. Um, we distinguish it from all other group A strep is because it has B antigens on the surface. Visually, we can't see that. We would have to do various types of testing to know if it has B antigens on it. If we grow it on a blood auger plate, it does do beta hemolysis, that breakdown of the red blood cells, just like that strep pyogenes does, but it's usually a little smaller. It's not quite as obvious on a plate. But it is resistant to the antibiotic bacitracin, which means it will grow right up to a, that particular antibiotic on a disc, unlike streptococcus pyogenes. 
Now, why we care about Streptococcus agalacti, because you've probably not really heard a lot about it before until this class. Um, the biggest issues usually become um, with neonatals, so new mothers, pregnant, uh, pregnant women. This is a bacteria that if a mom has it, healthy adult, no issues whatsoever. But this bacteria can get passed on to a child in childbirth, and that's when it becomes very deadly for infants. And so they call it a neonatal disease. This used to be one of the top one of, I don't know if they top, but it's a, one of the causes of a lot of infant deaths before we started to test for it and treat for it. It's one of the things that pregnant women, they will actually swab and test for uh, before giving birth to know if you're a carrier of this bacteria or not. And so in infants, it can cause bacteremia. That's just bacteria in the blood, which can be very deadly. It can cause meningitis, it's inflammation of the meninges. Again, also deadly, and it can also cause pneumonia in infants. Um, this usually occurs in about, it's like three in every thousand births. And you're like, well, that's not many. But then you think of how many births actually happen, you know, just even in our local hospitals every year. And then it's like three infants can be contracting this bacterial infection and it can be deadly uh, for them. It also can cause diseases in immunocompromised elderly patients. So you've probably never heard of it because, well, you're healthy and you don't know anyone that's ever suffered from it because it usually doesn't cause any issues uh, for healthy adults. Uh, it's just that neonatal, very newborns that have no working immune system um, that it causes the biggest issues. To test for it, they'll swab a pregnant woman, a pregnant woman uh, and test for it. They can do an ELISA test, just looking for the antigens for this bacteria. Super treatable. And I'm like, they'll just give that mother before childbirth, shortly before childbirth, um, some type of antibiotic, penicillin, ampicillin. Um, it will get rid of the bacteria before childbirth and then no issues whatsoever, passing that on to an infant. So I just take it before childbirth. Strep bacteria, because again, there's a lot of strep bacteria out there. Um, I don't know if I call them like the misfit group, but they're called the viridin group. They don't have A antigens, they don't have B antigens, so they don't fit into that normal Lansfield classification, but they're still strep bacteria. So they're kind of just like their own random group. On a blood auger plate, they're all alpha hemolytic, which means they're going to have kind of a greenish color. I was going to say it's bright in here. A greenish color on the plate. And a lot of the bacteria that are in this Viridin group of strep bacteria are normal oral flora, which is why when you swabbed your throats and you all held it up to last Tuesday, it was like a week ago, um, you all had some nice greening color because most of the bacteria you were probably growing from your throat cultures were bacteria that were in this you know, alpha hemolytic Viridin group of strep bacteria. Normal oral flora, normal bacteria. The problem becomes with some of these bacteria is they can become opportunistic bacteria, meaning they get somewhere where they're not supposed to go, and this usually becomes a big issue with immunocompromised um, and elderly patients. So it is one, um, an issue if it gets into the bloodstream. Now, in your mouth, normal bacteria, not an issue, but it can get into the bloodstream. How might it get into the bloodstream in your mouth? Something you're supposed to do every day that no one ever does. <laughs> floss. Um, if you're not a regular flosser and then all of a sudden you're like, one day you're like, I'm going to floss. Does it bleed? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, now you've got an open wound right there in these normal flora bacteria. Can now get into that bloodstream. And again, if you're healthy, not usually an issue, but elderly immunocompromised individuals, this becomes, can become very, very deadly because you've got bacteria in the bloodstream. It can cause meningitis. It can affect and get to the heart, causing endocarditis. It can be deadly. It's one of the top reasons why elderly and immunocompromised patients, before they have dental procedures, are actually put on an antibiotic. It's like, oh, you're, you know, if someone's immunocompromised, maybe they're having cancer treatment, they've got other issues with their immune system, oh, you've got a dental appointment coming up, <laughs> that just puts you on some antibiotics so that if you do get bacteria in your bloodstream, we can kind of head it off uh, before then. Because you also have bacteria hanging out in your teeth, these bacteria, as you feed them sugar, and they break that sugar down, they produce acid, and... They can cause plaque and cavities as well in your mouth. 
And I'm like, bacteria in your mouth. All over. One bacteria, that's not normally, I mean, it can be for a lot of individuals, carriers in your mouth. Um, I'm going to close this. This one cause more issues or more severe diseases. Uh, it's still in this misfit viridin group. It's Streptococcus pneumoniae. So it's still gram positive. It's still cocci. We're still in that shape. Um, it usually likes to hang out in very short chains or even sometimes pairs. On a plate, it's alpha hemolytic, as most of these viridin group strep bacteria are. Kind of what allows it to cause disease? The biggest thing is that the streptococcus pneumoniae has a capsule. And we already talked about different, you know, capsule stains. Why is it good to have a capsule? Uh, for the bacteria, it's good because it can avoid phagocytosis. Again, our white blood cells can't see it right away. They can't recognize it. It might be slippery. Um, and if it can hide, it doesn't get eaten. It's great for it. It also has a protein called adhesin. Based on the name of the protein, it allows it to stick to our respiratory tract. It can stick other places as well, but based on its name, yes, it can cause pneumonia, or pneumonia because it's Streptococcus pneumoniae. It is not the only thing that can cause pneumonia. And I'll say it again, pneumonia, I don't want to say pneumonia is not a disease because a disease is caused by one thing. Like, ah, oh, you have, you know, you've got strep throat, that's your disease. Well, because we know it's caused by streptococcus pyogenes. So that, there's that cause effect. Pneumonia is a condition because there's lots of things that can cause pneumonia. Pneumonia just means you've got fluid in the lungs. That's it. Um, Lots of bacteria can cause pneumonia. Lots of viruses can cause pneumonia. Fungus can cause pneumonia. Different parasites can cause pneumonia. They just cause this condition. And this is one of them. Another virulence factor that it has, it's called something called secretory IgA protease. Ends in an ACE, it's an enzyme. This, so we already just finished up immune system. Antibodies, also known as immunoglobulins, the Ig. So we make antibodies to fight off different types of bacteria and viruses. Well, this particular bacteria makes an enzyme that destroys the antibody or immunoglobulin A. So it was where we make antibodies to fight things off. This bacteria is like, hmm, I'm just gonna just break apart that particular antibody. Doesn't gonna break apart all the antibodies, only antibody A um, or immunoglobulin A, but it can start to like a fight against our immune system response. It's great for it bad for us. And it has or makes a protein called pneumolysin. Anything that has that lice word in it means it breaks stuff down. So this breaks apart epithelial cells, which allows the bacteria to get in and past the body. It can get past that mucous membrane. Um, it doesn't usually get in through skin, even though that's epithelial cells as well. It's a lot of epithelial cells. But it allows it to try to get past that mucous membrane and get to areas where it can cause more severe conditions. Now, it is called Streptococcus pneumoniae. And yes, one of the top things it can cause, based on its name, is pneumonia. People that are at highest risk of this particular pneumonia, elderly immunocompromised and infants. They're the ones that are going to suffer more severe complications with pneumonia. Now, I'm just going to bring it to your attention because you're going to see it, especially you know if you're going into respiratory. I can't remember respiratory therapy in here or um, nursing. A lot of times you're going to see the word pneumococcal. There's meaning in that word. Anything pneumo means it can affect the lungs. It's just part of the pneumo means lungs. Cockle means what? Where have you seen that part of the word before? Something's coccyx shaped. So if you see pneumococcal, we're talking about a coccyx shaped something that's going to affect the lungs. And so a pneumococcal disease or pneumococcal pneumonia, this just means a pneumonia condition. That's yes, it's affecting the lungs based on its name, but it's also telling you a little bit about what's causing the pneumonia just based on its name. It's a bacteria that's causing pneumonia. Because again, there are viruses that can cause pneumonia. There's, you know, fungus that can cause pneumonia. If you see pneumococcal, you're like, oh, it's a bacterial pneumonia. And how can you treat a bacteria? 
If a patient has a pneumococcal or a bacterial pneumonia, what can you give them? You can give them an antibiotic. If they have another type of pneumonia caused by a virus, can you give them antibiotics for that? No. Um, so right there in its name, it tells you a lot about it. It's like, oh, okay, the patient has pneumonia, and it's caused by a bacteria, and it's a coxal-shaped bacteria, because there's bacilli-shaped organisms that can cause um, pneumonia as well. So I'm like, that, its name right away tells you it's a coxi-shaped bacteria. It really narrows down what it's going to be technically is the streptococcus bacteria that's causing the pneumonia. Now, although pneumonia is in its name, it is not, pneumonia is not the only thing it can cause. You can get a sinus infection that's caused by streptococcus pneumonia. You can get an otitis media. What's that? An infection of where? Otitis? Anything oat is ear. Um, so this just means an ear infection. So at some point, you probably had an ear infection or a sinus infection sometime in your life. It could have been caused by streptococcus pneumoniae. Again, just because of its name, uh, doesn't mean it only causes pneumonia. It can get into the bloodstream, causing blood infections. It can cause the um, heart infections, and it can cause meningitis. Again, lots of things can cause meningitis. Meningitis, to me, is just a condition, just like pneumonia is. But if you have pneumococcal meningitis, we have a cocci-shaped bacteria that's causing inflammation of the meninges, which means this is treatable with antibiotics. Again, the earlier you get treated, the better. Now, how do we know if it's streptococcus pneumonia? Some ways we can diagnose it. Well, we can gram stain some sputum sample. You know, what are you coughing up from the lungs? If we start to see gram-positive cocci, we start to see it in some of those short chains. Um, we could culture it, put it on a blood auger plate. We can look that for that alpha hemolysis. But as there's lots of alpha hemolytic organisms that are gram positive, um, one way to really help narrow it down is we can look to see if it's sensitive to the antibiotic optogen. How we know that? We just put a little optogen disc soaked in antibiotic optogen. It gets a P on the disc. I don't know why not a no. Um, and because it's sensitive to that antibiotic, it will not grow anywhere near it. It means that it, that antibiotic is actually working against that bacteria. Um, it's also soluble in bile. If you put it in bile, it will break down in bile. Treatment, it's treatable, super easy. Penicillin, top, you know, antibiotic that's given. If it's not working, they usually go to erythromycin. Otherwise, we've got a whole slew of antibiotics that can treat it. Um, I didn't bring up the right PowerPoint. I put a picture on here earlier this morning. Um, it is easily preventable. I'm seeing more and more commercials these days. I'm so excited. Um, we have a relatively new uh, vaccine. Well, I don't say new like in the last five years, but it really has only been advertised and really tried to actively uh, prescribed called Pneumovax. Again, it's a vaccine. Um, against a pneumo organism that uh, affects the lungs. Um, and I've seen, yeah, commercials. They're targeting it to elderly. Again, a lot of individuals, healthy adults, healthy immune systems, usually don't suffer any severe complications. Um, and it's called pneumovax. I think they even put the 23 after it. Just means that there are technically 23 different variants of this particular bacteria. I Many of them are all slightly different from each other, um, antigen-wise. Um, and this particular vaccine, it makes you immune to all 23 of them. Um, I know there's a couple different pneumovax vaccines that are um, for like the top 15 um, or even the top 20, but now we've got like our newest against the top 23 um, of the different little variants of this particular bacteria. So look for it now, you'll see commercials for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yep. I was going to say it, I'm like, and I might not have talked about it. Which, which bacteria? That would probably be in the intro video. Because there's like 20 minutes. Which one? The, the pyogenines? Yeah. We all in the intro. I was going to say, I just skipped ahead to it.
This one? Yeah. Location is found in the skin, also in the reproductive tract. Generally, if I don't specifically say something, I probably would not quiz on it either. Because I was like, I don't care about virulence factors for it. Um, our next genus that we're going to talk about, we're still in gram-positive cocci. We're still in bacteria that are catalase negative, which means you're not going to see any bubbles because they don't make catalase. Um, so if it's not a streptococcus bacteria, it's an enterococcus bacteria. Now, if something has entero in its name, any guess where we would find it in the body? Enteritis. Generally, you're going to find this in the intestines. If you have gastroenteritis, that just means you have inflammation of the stomach and the intestines. Anything entero is intestinally found because you see it in a lot of words and it's kind of nice right away knowing um, where it is. So enterococcus, again, they're cocci shaped bacteria and they are generally found in the digestive tract. If we gram stain them, again, they're all still gram positive, also likes to hang out in pairs and short chains. So again, if we just gram stain, you're like, well, is it an enterococcus or a streptococcus? Because a lot of strep like to hang out that way too. Um, so then there's other ways we can narrow it down. There are lots of enterococcus bacteria out there. There's only two species that affect humans. So they're the only ones we care about in this class. Enterococcus faecalis and enterococcus facium. Again, they are found in the colon, the intestines. It's part of their name. They can be in there not causing any issues whatsoever, but if they get somewhere else, that's when we get into some severe complications. And they're supposed to be found in the intestinal tract. We don't want them anywhere else. Now, they are also um, a top cause of what are known as nosocomial or healthcare associated infections. Meaning these are bacteria that cause issues in hospital settings. Um, and again, when you're in the hospital, you've got sick people that may be immunocompromised. There's lots of medical procedures going on. And if you have any kind of surgery, this is when this is the biggest issue with this bacteria. If there's any kind of surgery that has to do with intestines, this is a bacteria that can get elsewhere. And again, if it gets elsewhere, it causes lots of issues because it's enterococcus bacteria, any these two that are in this genus, that are becoming very resistant to antibiotics. So like super resistant. We're getting to, um, to the point where we're calling these super bugs is because we have very few things to treat it. So you've got immunocompromised individuals, lots of medical procedures, and this is a bacteria that causes issues and is becoming almost untreatable. Now diagnosing it is if we put this particular bacteria in bile, um, it's not going to dissolve. It's not sensitive to bile. Part of the reason it's, it's found in the intestines. That's where bile is. Like it's evolved to handle bile, whereas strep bacteria do not. So and if we go back to kind of just this little thing, two bacteria, this can handle hanging out in bile, no issues. This one would dissolve. So it's one easy way to see, you know, will it grow in the presence of bile? Will it dissolve in bile? That right there can tell us, you know, is it a strep or is it an enterobacteria? Prevention is difficult because everyone's a carrier. This thing hangs out in our intestines. We can't just get rid of the bacteria. It's there, it's around. Our biggest way to, for prevention is just minimize transmission, you know, proper PPE, proper hygiene, making sure, you know, everything is followed, um, that we just don't get bacteria where we're not supposed to get bacteria. It's the best we can do. We're going to shift, shift over to a whole new shape. Um, gram-positive rods or gram-positive bacilli. Now, of all the gram-positive bacilli out there, we split them into two groups, not a test that we do in the lab that splits the groups, but it's a feature that some of them have. So there are two genus of gram-positive bacilli that can make endospores. We've already talked about those two genus, bacillus and clostridium. Um, and then there's a whole group of gram-positive bacilli that don't make endospores. 
So we're first going to talk about the endospore bacteria. I just need to carry this thing. Um, starting first with the bacillus genus. Now, there are lots of bacillus bacteria out there. Lots of species. Very few cause disease. Like, I can guarantee on that very first lab that some of you swabbed random things. I can guarantee, because I, I know what they look like on a plate, um, there were probably a lot of bacillus bacteria. Not causing issues whatsoever. So we only care about the ones that do. <laughs> and the top one that's in the bacillus genus that causes issues for humans um, is bacillus anthracis. And it causes issues. Its biggest virulence factor that it causes disease is the toxin anthrax. When we talk about anthrax poisoning, it just means you now have that toxin in your body. A lot of times it's not the bacteria that causes the issues, it's the toxin that the bacteria makes that causes all the issues. Now there are three ways you can pick up this bacteria, and depending on how you pick it up, depends on what kind of anthrax disease you have. You could either, one, ingest those spores, you ingest the bacteria, so you ate some bacteria, Two, you can get them through any kind of open wound. Or three, you inhale them if they're airborne. So three ways you can pick it up. Depending on how you pick it up, depends on what kind of anthrax disease you have. If you ate the spores, which again, all of these are rare. It's rare you would probably ever, um, I don't want to say experience it with a patient. It's rare you'll have a patient with it. Um, but if someone ate the bacteria, and it's rare, but you now have gastrointestinal anthrax. Again, all of these are deadly. Um, the gastrointestinal and inhalation are the deadliest. Um, but I say, if you're untreated, 50% will die um, of gastrointestinal anthrax. I mean, that's not great odds. You're like, oh, well, we'll just treat with some antibiotics. It'll be fun. Even if you treat with antibiotics, your survival rate only goes up 10%. Um, so even if treated, I'm going to say 40% still die. Again, the toxins are very, very deadly to the body. It will like completely destroy all body systems. If you get it, this particular bacteria, because of the toxins that it creates in that open wound, will form, like it will destroy the tissue. They're called these black eschars. And so you end up with these black lesions anywhere the bacteria is. This is the least deadly, still rare. Um, it's not as rare as the other two. Um, it's the least deadly though, because if as long as we can like see it right away, we can treat surface or topical antibiotics, we can take um, oral antibiotics, and we can even remove uh, the bacteria at those wound sites as well. Um, so it's the least deadly. And then there's inhalation anthrax as you inhale the bacteria, which means the toxins that it creates are going to destroy your lungs. Um, irreplaceable lung tissue is going to be destroyed. Um, very, very deadly as well. Very rare. But again, it's out there. Again, I say I'm like, it's pretty rare you'll experience patients with anthrax. I don't even know of any cases I was like in our area that I've heard of patients having it. I did have a student like several years ago. Um, that her brother, was like out in Colorado or something like that, had actually had the cutaneous anthrax. Um, he survived, but he had to have it surgically removed, lots of antibiotics, hospitalized for a very, very long um, period of time. Um, how, you can get pick, how you can get it picked up, this bacteria lives in soil naturally. Again, it's not super common. It usually lives in soil. It usually lives um, closer to um, farm animals. It's not uncommon that um, cattle can be carriers of this particular bacteria. So it's like if you're working in dirt, you know, in areas where it is, and you have open wounds, it does put you at higher risk of it. How we can grow it? We can grow it on blood augers. Um, again, usually on a plate, the colonnaires are very large, very white for any bacillus. We do have treatments. I'm like, we do have antibiotics um, that can treat it. The sooner you get treated, the better. I know it's happened where, it's been a while since I've seen it, anything in the news, where, oh, they, you know, some anthrax in the mail, you know, they thought there was going to be some anthrax outbreak, some type of um, bioterrorism. If someone, if they think someone may have been exposed, you know, bioterrorism or not, to this particular bacteria, they are going to treat you before you ever have symptoms. 
because again, by the time you have symptoms, the damage is already getting done uh, from the toxins. So they can sit there and uh, treat you if you think you've been exposed. Uh, prevention, testing animals, particular farm animals for it, especially if there's a outbreak or any particular cases. We do have a vaccine for it. Um, this is not a routine vaccine. So unless you are someone maybe in a lab that's testing for this, that may actually have exposure to it frequently. Um, if you know you're working with particular phantom farm animals that are at a high risk, you know, you are in an area where it's getting found, they might vaccinate you then. Um, but they're not going to vaccinate the masses because it's just so rare um, of a bacteria. And the vaccine itself doesn't carry a long-term um, protection immune system wise, so it requires lots of boosters. So it's just not a common vaccine given. Our second group of our gram positive bacilli that also make endospores are the clostridiums. And there are four clostridium species that cause a lot of human diseases. None of them are pretty, all of them are pretty deadly. Know these four, like know the four. Now, what makes them, you know, their biggest virulence factor, what makes anything in the Clostridium genus um, so deadly and so hard, um, harsh is that all of these bacteria, they can make endospores. Again, just like bacillus, that's a huge thing for the bacteria to have. It's, it can go dormant and it's resistant to lots of things. Anything in the Clostridium genus, though, does grow anaerobically. So it does not like to grow anywhere there's oxygen where we find clostridium bacteria. Lots of places. We can find clostridium bacteria in the soil. We can find it in water supplies. We can find it in the digestive tract of humans. So there's lots of clostridium out there and it's found in lots of different ways. How we pick it up, where it gets in the body, and which clostridium it is, depends on what kind of diseases that you're gonna end up having. Other virulence factors that Clostridium have is they do make two unique enzymes. Um, one's called a lipase, one's called a protease, and then their en enzymes, the end in ACE. Lipase breaks apart lipids. Protease breaks apart proteins. And so these two enzymes really allow these bacteria to digest us. So they can start to digest different tissues. They can break apart lipids, like our phospholipid membranes. They can break apart proteins in our cells. So I'm like, they can really do a lot of damage by digesting us. The first of our Clostridium bacteria is called Clostridium perfringens. If you're going into nursing, which I think most of you are in here, you, and depending on what you already do as a part-time job, you may have actually had patients um, that have had this particular bacteria. Um, it's quite common in nursing homes. Uh, I don't say common, but it's found um, in patients in nursing homes, especially those that are diabetic. Um, so that's why I've, I've had students in the past that are like, oh yeah, I totally had a patient last week um, that had this. But it's also found in hospital settings because that's where you go to get treated. Uh, so again, the toxin that it produces is what's going to cause a lot of issues. And because it can break apart tissues, it causes irreversible damage to the body. It digests us. And as it digests us and it kills cells, it does, as it digests, does produce this very noxious, very smelly gas. So a lot of times they call it gas gangrene because one, it produces a very stinky smell and the gangrene because it produces completely dead tissue. This is where usually I have patients, I've had students, maybe you've had this or not. Has anyone had a patient? I don't know if you guys work that's had this. Yeah. Nursing home or hospital, yeah. Um, again, this bacteria, it's out there, it's in the digestive tract. Um, so if you've got dirty hands, not washing, and an open wound, and if you're diabetic, so you have very lo uh, low immune system, you've got very low blood flow, especially to different extremities, this bacteria gets in underneath that skin into that anaerobic environment, and it will completely break down all the skin, and it's very smelly. It's got a very unique stink to it. Like you can walk into a patient's room and be like, whoa, um, very stinky. It can also, because again, dirty hands, and you, know, you don't wash your hands and you're touching stuff. Um, it can cause food poisoning as well. That's not that deadly though. <laughs> you're not making it think you're gonna die because it causes very extreme diarrhea. 
but how they can diagnose it, one, um, if they think you've got food poisoning, they're gonna look for this particular bacteria, and if there's high enough counts, we're like, yeah, I, they usually don't even do bacterial counts, and a lot of times if you've got diarrhea, you're probably not even going to the doctor. Um, but they can look to see if there's enough bacteria in that fecal matter to say that it's food poisoning caused by this particular bacteria. They can grow it up on a blood auger plate, and it does kind of something cool called a double zone of hemolysis that, it's bright in here, there's like a very light clearing, and around the edge, it almost has a reddish kind of halo around the hemolysis. Treatment, if you've got food poisoning caused by this, the treatment is just to let the um, diarrhea happen. It's not uncommon that if someone gets diarrhea, the first thing they go grab is some type of anti-diarrheal medicine. It's not a bad thing to let the diarrhea happen. It is your body's way of really fast getting rid of something that's not supposed to be there. And if you take an anti-diarrhea, you're actually making that bacteria stay longer in your body, possibly reproducing. Um, so treatment for food poisoning, just let the diarrhea happen. Bacteria will leave with that uh, diarrhea. Gas gangrene, so if you've got tissue that's infected, Again, it's necrotic. You're not gonna save that tissue. It's completely dead. You're gonna have to have it surgically removed. And depending on how bad it is, it could, could mean full amputation. It could mean amputation of um, toes, extremities. It could mean amputation of legs. Prevention, refrigerate food, proper food handling so you don't get the uh, food poisoning. And then cleaning wounds properly. So this becomes very important. That's why we actually have like wound nurses, like we've got wound care. Um, people that are diabetic that usually have um, a lot of extremity issues because of their immune system and blood flow. Um, again, they usually are highest risk of picking up this particular bacteria. But if you can clean those wounds, make sure that bacteria does not get into those wounds into that anaerobic environment. Our next clostridium is probably the one you probably are most familiar with, at least its name, and I've talked it already about it this semester, is the clostridium difficile, also more commonly known as C. diff. Again, there are lots of clostridium. We're talking the top four that cause human disease. Because there are so many clostridium out there, whether they cause human disease, whether they're just out there in the environment, they have been trying to rename them. Um, because there are just so many clostridium, they wanted to like subgroup them, not just species names. And again, for a long time, they wanted to call it, oh, was it gastroclostridium difficile? It's because it's found intestinally or in stun the stomach. Um, but then it was like, no, everything's called C. diff these days, not G. diff. And so they decided to keep, you know, the C. Um, I still have clostridium up there. Again, there are still so many clostridium. Um, they did rename it. It's actually called clostridioids. Um, I just haven't changed my PowerPoint yet because most of the time a lot of other stuff out there uh, hasn't changed it yet. But don't be surprised if you're like, oh, clostridioids difficile. That seems different than clostridium. It's not, they just renamed it, but they renamed it in a way that we can still keep C. diff as its acronym. Uh, it's found in the intestine. You guys right now might have C. diff in your intestines and it's causing no issues whatsoever for you. So it's a normal flora for a lot of individuals. But it can become an opportunistic pathogen and cause issues, usually if you take a broad spectrum antibiotic. This bacteria found in your intestine, probably in some of you right now, uh, just based on percentage, is kept in check by other bacteria that's in your intestines. Again, there's only so much food, there's only so much room. All the bacteria kind of keep each other in check on how many you know, are allowed to hang out. But if you take a broad spectrum antibiotic and you kill a lot of your normal flora, these guys are hard to kill. Your normal antibiotic will probably not kill them all. And so you don't have the other bacteria to keep them in check and they kind of throw themselves a big old party and reproduce like crazy after a broad spectrum antibiotic. And that's when they become an issue. Depending how many are there, depending on your immune system response, it can cause you know, a minor infection, kind of just some intestinal upset to explosive diarrhea. That's actually how the book describes it. Um, it can cause damage to your intestinal tract. So I mean, explosive diarrhea does not sound pleasant, um, but that's not even usually the biggest issue. That's 
sounds like an issue. But that's not even the biggest issue, is this bacteria, as it gets into the intestine and it has itself a party and it's reproducing like crazy because nothing's keeping it in check, it is causing damage to the intestinal wall lining. It's called pseudomembranous colitis. It's inflammation of the colon wall. Again, the inside of your colon, it's got lots of membranes in there. So that bacteria that's in the intestinal tract doesn't get out of the intestinal tract. Well, this bacteria causes damage to that membrane. So you actually have ulcers inside the intestinal tract. That's an open wound into your intestinal tract. And there's lots of bacteria in your intestinal tract. They now have an open wound, like a free access to get into the blood supply of your body through that open wound in there. And a lot of bacteria in your intestinal tract Fine in your intestinal tract, bad if they leave. And so it causes a lot of other infections because you've got other bacteria leaving the intestinal tract causing issues. It is a nosocomial pathogen. It's a top healthcare associated infection. Um, again, it's not because you go to the hospital and you pick up the bacteria at the hospital. It's because of things that happen at the hospital that cause this issue. One, and I'm like, if you weren't a carrier of it to begin with, you may pick it up while you're there um, during some type of procedure, a lot of times colonoscopies. Um, if medical equipment wasn't cleaned properly and someone did have C. diff, and now that instrument is now put in you, you now have C. diff, um, puts you at a higher risk of picking it up. Also, when you're in a healthcare setting, it's when a lot of antibiotics are prescribed because you've got if you know other issues going on. Um, and it may kill the other keeping in check bacteria. And so it's not because it's always picked up there, but because of procedures where you could pick it up and the antibiotics that are given. Diagnosing it, they can isolate the bacteria from the feces, look for it, identify it. They can screen for the toxins. They can do what's known as a PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Um, this is looking for the DNA of this bacteria to identify it. Treatment, this is one of those few bacteria that if you have a bacterial infection, you would stop taking antibiotics instead of giving antibiotics. It's because the antibiotics are killing the normal flora and we need those normal flora to keep this bacteria in check. A lot of times they're gonna stop antimicrobial or antibiotics from being given, try to get those normal flora back. Severe infections, you may be given a really strong antibiotic that's going to like kill the normal flora, but it's going to kill this bacteria. Um, C. diff is hard to kill, so like you need the strongest antibiotics and sometimes a longer uh, extended dose of them. Um, and one of the co new coolest ways of treatment is a fecal transplant. So if you did kill all of your normal flora bacteria, which are there to keep this bacteria in check, Instead of waiting and hoping they all start to recolonate and regrow, well, let's take some feces from someone else that has all the normal flora, put it in you, and now you've got those keeper normal flora back. Super effective, like super effective for people that antibiotics aren't working, nothing else is working. Fecal transplant, it's like night and day. Um, so it's one of our newest methods um, of treatment. Best prevention, good hygiene, probiotics. So if you do have to take a broad spectrum antibiotic, a lot of times the doctor, if you've got a good doctor, will be like, you should eat some yogurt. And you know, I'm like, try to eat things that are going to sit there and try to keep your normal flora bacteria um, up, keep those high numbers up. Our third clostridium is clostridium botulinum. Now I'm going to do like a general AMP refresher of how does a muscle contract. So Remember back in AMP, you've got your skeletal muscle, striations, you've got your axon, your neuron, you've got your little axon terminals, and you have action potentials. This all sounds familiar, right, from AMP? You've got action potentials that are going to travel along the axon. It's going to go to the end, the axon terminal. Here's my zoomed in axon terminal. It's just this attached to the skeletal muscle. And that action potential, that's my little arrow that's coming down, my action potential is going to tell these little, little vesicles that are containing acetylcholine, 
that's the little circles, the little blue things. Um, acetylcholine, these vesicles are going to fuse to the end of the accent terminal. They're going to release all that acetylcholine. That acetylcholine is going to travel through that little synaptic cleft, and it's going to create another type of action potential right at your skeletal muscle, and your skeletal muscle will contract. Right? Generally in P. That, I think, when I taught generally in P, it's been a long time, was like an entire 45-minute lecture right there. Now, why I care about it. That's how a normal skeletal muscle contracts. It allows me to do this. I've got acetylcholine doing all this, and I can sit here and do this anytime your skeletal muscle contracts. What Clostridium botulinum does? Again, it's not the bacteria that causes the issues. It's the toxin, that botulism toxin, that causes the issue. The toxin that this bacteria makes covers the end of an axon terminal. So if you've got a toxin that covers the end of an axon terminal and you want your skeletal muscle to contract, well, because this is covered, this can't fuse with the end of the axon terminal. Acetylcholine can't get released. And this skeletal muscle never gets that signal that it needs to contract. So the botulism toxin stops muscles from contracting. Now, where you may have heard of this outside of this class is what we use it for. So the botulism toxin, if I take the bow of botulism and the tox of toxin, what do I get? Botox. Botoxes. Um, is they inject that, this toxin underneath the skin. The idea is that toxin underneath the skin is going to do exactly this. It's going to stop the muscles from contracting. Now, your wrinkles is because your muscles are contracting. I got lens wrinkles. Uh, your muscles are contracting right here. And every time your skeletal muscles contract, even in your face, it causes your skin to like fold up, aka wrinkles. Well, if your skeletal muscle can't contract, not going to happen. What are some issues with this? Everybody. The idea is if they inject it right underneath the skin, it should stay there. However, and again, I'm like, I, oh, there we go. There's warnings. If you listen to the Botox commercials, they have warnings that say something like this. You know, the effects of Botox and the toxin that's in there may spread from the area of injection. Hmm, that doesn't sound good. Um, it could produce symptoms consistent with the botulism toxin. Um, it can be life-threatening. You might not be able to swallow. There are skeletal muscles involved in swallowing. There are skeletal muscles involved in breathing. Your diaphragm is a skeletal muscle, and if your diaphragm can't contract, you can't breathe. And what happens if you can't breathe? on there and they even sit there and they'll in the commercials for Botox they'll talk about them if you have issues with swallowing or breathing you should go see your provider um, it's because they are injecting the toxin but you know no wrinkles great where we get the botulism toxin so this bacteria again can ease it's usually found um, out in the environment it's usually found in soil but again if something's found in dirt it can kind of get anywhere um, how we pick it up the number one way we generally pick it up is we ingest the toxin. There are bacteria present anymore. Bacteria could have all died, but if you ingest the toxin, that's what's going to kill you. I'm going to talk more about that. No, I'll talk about it now. Because um, I was going to say, this is the number one re way we pick up this particular bacteria. And it's usually because it's found out in soil, it's found out in the environment, it's usually picked up by improper canning. Which means if you've got someone that's in the garden and they pick all their vegetables and whatever and they're gonna can them and they didn't maybe wash them properly, didn't can them properly, and that bacteria is in there, that bacteria is gonna grow for a while. At some point it's gonna die out. Um, but all the toxins that it made, if you ingest them, it's quite deadly. Um, so you ingest the toxins. One thing they say you should never eat if you ever see a bulging can. Don't even open it. 
Um, if it's bulging, it's because the, there was bacteria in there and they were growing. Um, and it easily can be this particular bacteria. This bacteria, because uh, it is an endospore bacteria, it's hard to kill. Normal boiling of 100 <laughs> degrees Celsius will not kill this bacteria. So again, if you can, I can stuff. There's two ways that you can can. You can boil can things and you can pressure can things. Boiling will not kill this bacteria. However, boiling plus decreasing the pH by adding an acid, that can kill it. So if you ever look at a recipe before you boil things, um, a lot of things will say, add some lemon juice. And you're like, ooh, for a lemon flavor? No, the lemon juice is there to decrease the pH. So that boil canning will you know, kill this particular bacteria. Um, sugary foods, a lot of fruits naturally have acid in them. It's usually vegetables that don't have any acid in them whatsoever naturally that you have to decrease the pH. Otherwise, you have to pressure can it because you're going to need that temperature higher than a, that boiling 100 degrees Celsius. You know, so for fun factoids, keep everyone safe if you can. Another way you can pick it up is it's called infant botulism. So you guys could actually eat some Clostridium botulinum, usually not even suffer the issues. You're like, I could just eat soil. I could eat mud and dirt, and I can eat this bacteria. Your immune system would kill the bacteria, most likely before it ever made enough toxins to cause any issues. Infants don't have a strong immune system, so they, if they ingest any of the bacteria, their immune systems can't kill the bacteria. The bacteria will stay in there. They will reproduce. It will produce toxins. It can be deadly. Pretty rare. Um, but the number one place that actually infants pick up this bacteria is by eating honey. So if you've ever seen honey, look at the back of any honey bottle you ever buy. Um, so if you have honey at home, take a look at it. It should have some warning on it. Do not feed to infants under the age of one. Honey, because of the high sugar content and just what's in honey to begin with, honey itself is actually antibacterial, which is actually if you've got a wound and you're stuck out in the middle of nowhere and you've got access to honey, you know, you could put honey on a wound and it's antibacterial. It's cool. Um, they don't even have to like can honey like they normally do other stuff because bacteria cannot survive in honey, except this bacteria. And so if you guys eat honey and there's Clostridium botulinum in it, not a big issue. Um, it's in there. It's dormant because it's not happy that it's in there. Um, but it's an endospore. It's hanging out in the honey. But infants that eat honey that don't have an immune system, this bacteria will grow and cause issues in infants. So it's, if you ever wonder why there was that label on honey, it's because of this bacteria that might be present in there. Um, another way is we could get the bacteria in wounds also going to cause issues because that bacteria can get into that anaerobic environment. It can reproduce. Um, it usually takes a while um, before you start to see symptoms. What are symptoms? So if you ate something, you know, you're like, I want to see what those peaches taste like. Um, if you ate something that has this toxin in it, or if you got the bacteria in a wound and it started to reproduce and make the toxins, usually within the first, like, first day or two, um, the toxin's starting to do damage. And you're usually going to have some blurry vision. Again, it's going to affect skeletal muscles. Um, the skeletal muscles that control eyes are very small. And so a lot of times you're going to see the effect in those smaller muscle things first. You're going to have blurry vision. You may have constipation because that's just causing issues with the digestive tract. Um, but usually if you're not treated within the first week, it becomes deadly. Because again, <laughs> your diaphragm, can't breathe. Um, it can be treated though. Um, the symptoms again, blurry vision, constipation, usually abdominal pain are the first symptoms. How they treat it, does they actually give you antibodies against the bacteria? It's like we could make antibodies because it could take so long, the bacteria can kill you faster than your immune system can respond. So they'll give you antibodies against this bacteria and then they're going to give you some antibiotics to kill the bacteria. So it stops making any of those uh, toxins. Prevention, proper food canning, number one. And then no honey to infants until one, when they start to get that stronger immune system. The last of our clostridium, I didn't get through them. I have to read. I'll tape the last part of our lecture today. Um, the last of our clostridium is clostridium tetani. 
Now, I say know the difference between botulinum and how it works and tetani because they are almost opposite of each other. So botulinum stops a muscle from contracting, hence the Botox. We stop the muscles from contracting. Tetani almost does the opposite. It doesn't, it doesn't make a muscle contract, but it keeps the muscle contracted so it can't relax. Like a muscle will contract and it will just never relax, ever. And again, it has to do with action potentials um, and antagonistic muscles where when one muscle contracts, another muscle has to relax. So if I contract my biceps, my triceps has to relax to allow my biceps to contract. Well, this prevents the relaxation of muscles. So the muscles will contract, nothing will relax, and they will stay in that fully contracted state. And so it's the toxin that does it. So it's not the bacteria, it's the toxin that does it. And it's called tetanospasm. So it's that fully contracted muscle state. Now, diagnosing it. One of the first areas that we normally see these permanently contracted muscles is in the face. And so one of the first things is lockjaw. Means the muscles in your face and your cheeks that allow your jaw to relax. So every time you lower your jaw, it's because you're relaxing your muscles, it's gravity. Um, but if your muscles stay in a permanently contracted state in your face, you literally can't open your mouth. So it's called lockjaw. Now, um, the symptoms, I mean, that's one of the first things that may take you and get you to the hospital. A lot of times you might just be having muscle spasm before you even get to that state. All of a sudden you're like, well, my muscle just kind of contracted and I couldn't relax it. And I don't know what was going on. Get it checked out. Um, what they're going to do or treat you with. And unfortunately, a lot of times by the time you're having symptoms, it's usually too late. I mean, there's been enough bacteria in there making enough toxin. And even if we start treating, um, the damage has been done or is still being done. But they're going to try to treat you for antibodies against the toxin. You know, heads up, our local hospitals do not carry this on, on hand. So I'm like, they would have to specially order, you know, this particular antibody, get it shipped here while you're just trying to survive. And they'll give you some antibiotics to kill any bacteria so that you, you know, stop having more toxin being made. And then they're going to vaccinate you, you know, to try to really get your immune system pumped up um, and fighting against it. But the best it all together and just get vaccinated. We have the tetanus vaccine, um, which is super effective. Again, so because of our very effective vaccine, this is not a very common bacteria. Where do most people think this bacteria hangs out? Tetanus. So I, most people will associate it with rust. That's not to say it's not there. This bacteria is naturally found in soil. Now, if something's rusty, is it outside? Yeah. Um, and if it's rusty, it's exposed to all the elements, which could include any dust from the ground landing on it. And a lot of times things that are rusty are very sharp and jagged and easily able to cause a wound if you get scratched on it. So now you have open wound that's super dirty with this possible bacteria. Um, that doesn't mean if you have an open wound and I go gardening and I'm digging in the dirt, that's just as likely to pick it up. So it's not just rust, um, but everyone associates with rust. I'm not exactly sure, just the rust itself where it derived from. It's dirt, open wound, there you go. Um, again, it's rare. I did hear it was like six years ago. We did have a case. Um, Oh, was it Gunderson or Mayo? I think it was Gunderson. We did have a case of someone that came in. There's a whole group of individuals that live in this kind of area that don't get a lot of vaccines or healthcare. Any guess? Amish. Amish. Amish don't get all their regular vaccines. They don't get a lot of their boosters. They don't, you know, take the buggy. You don't see buggies at Gunderson and Mayo, um, you know, getting all their repeated boosters. And so a lot of Amish are not kept up to date on vaccine. But it was like six, seven years ago that they, we did have an Amish case um, that ended up, I think he originally came in with muscle spasms. 
Um, so they caught it early, but they actually had to still put him in medically induced coma. They had to order the antibodies. He survived, but I think he was in the hospital for over a month. Um, so it was rare that he even survived. So, you know, just get vaccinated and you're fine. For the last part, I didn't talk fast enough, apparently. Because um, there's four other genus of bacterium that are gram-positive bacilli, don't make endospores. My little heads up listeria, I'm gonna find it because we did just have a listeria recall. So I'm trying to find, if I find some cool stuff in the news, I, I'll throw it on. Now that we're getting into bacteria and viruses and stuff, um, I'll throw it on Blackboard. There was a big listeria outbreak last month. Um, not outbreak, but recall of foods that may possibly have listeria. But I'll record this last bit and guess and it'll be about 10, 15 minutes.